Okay, we're going to talk this morning about the sin of feminism. And uh, I always like to define the words. And it was interesting because I tried looking up the word feminist in my famous Webster's 1828 dictionary. And shock of all shocks, it's not in there. <laughs> so I had to look it up in this newer one. This is, a, I think, a 1950-something um, and the word feminist is an advocate or supporter of feminism. That's always helpful. <laughs> uh, feminism. The theory that women should have political, economic, and social rights equal to those of men. The movement to win such rights for women. Okay. And uh, in contrast to that, I want to read Webster's 1828 definition for feminine. Uh, now, there's a lot of these definitions in here that are a lot more in line with the Bible. Um, so let's look at the definition here. Okay, definition number one, pertaining to a woman or to women or to females. Okay, number two, soft, tender, delicate. Number three, effeminate, destitute of manly qualities. <laughs> number four, in grammar denoting the gender or words which signify females or the termination of such words words are said to be of their feminine of the feminine gender when they denote females or have the terminations proper to express females in any given language so but you see basically there a description of what women should be soft tender delicate feminine destitute of manly qualities that's the way it should be you know they you know they they talk about women you know you you throw like a girl well you're supposed to women are supposed to throw like a girl you know, they're not supposed to have those manly qualities. Uh, and I just want to say, this sermon is not about bashing women. It's about bashing feminism. <laughs> um, you got to understand that God created things to be separate. Okay, Women are not to be equal with men because men aren't equal with, with women. There are certain areas where women excel. There are certain areas where men excel. And you shouldn't blur those distinctions. Um, you know, God created women for a different purpose than he created men. And it's important to remember that. Um, so we're going to look at some uh, stuff. Of, you know, what does the Bible say about feminism? So turn first to Galatians chapter 3. And um, here there is actually an example in the Bible where women and men are equal. And... We're going to see what this equality is about. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Okay, Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, of course, everybody knows that there are Jews, there are Greeks, there's bond, there's free, and there's male, and there's female. Okay? But when it comes to salvation, you're all one. There's no distinctions there. It's not, you know, Islam and uh, Buddhism and Mormonism. They teach in eternity that there's, you know, men and women are not on the same plane. Well, that's nonsense. That's not true. In Christianity, according to the Bible, men and women are equal in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean that you both do the same things while here in this life. God has different purposes for women. He has different purposes for men. And you do, if you're a woman, then you look through the Bible and you say, okay, this is what the Bible says I should be doing. That's what you do. And you don't say, well, I'm as good as a man. I'm going to do what, what men do. No, you don't do that. Okay, because you lose your feminism or your your femininity, I should say, not your feminism. You lose your femininity when you begin to do things that God said for men to do. And likewise, men, when they try to take on women's roles, will lose their masculinity. And uh, we're going to see that as we go on here. Uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Actually, we're going to see that in this point here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 
Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, what's the kingdom of God again? It's a spiritual kingdom. We've been over that in other uh, lessons. We're not going to get in, into that now. Um, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Look at the next one. Nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What's the effeminate there? Is that women? Of course not. God wants women to be effeminate. The effeminate there is men. Men that act like sissies. God doesn't want that. Why? Because God wants a clear distinction between men and women. Men should act like men, dress like men, you know, be men. Women should dress like women, look like women, and be women. I mean, that's God wants a distinction there. Okay? Now, let's look at some of the points, you know, where uh, the distinctions, the separation between men and women. We're going to look at three points. Uh, turn over to... Uh, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And point number one here, 1 Corinthians 11, 14 is where we're going to be going. Point number one is uh, women should look and act different than men. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for her or to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So, and there's there's a lot more there we could go over, but I want to just stick to the point here. There's a distinction between a man's hairstyle and a woman's hairstyle. Women should be feminine. They should have longer hair than men. Men should have short hair. And when a man has long hair, it's a shame to him. Okay. And it's interesting because we don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read it here. Revelation chapter 9 verse 7 through 8 says, And the shapes of the locust were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Interesting. These uh, demonic uh, locust things that come up out of the bottomless pit during the tribulation they have the faces of men and the hair of women. Now, if God doesn't care if you have long hair, like a lot of the modern apostates teach, oh, God doesn't care about your hairstyle, you know. If that's true, then why would he say, why does the Bible say, faces of men, hair of women? You should not have long hair as a man. And now there's, there, you know, they kind of brought it out in the 1960s and stuff, and, you know, with the whole hippie thing, and that went into the rock and roll thing, and, you know, and it's come up through, and that long hairstyle is always there, in some form or another. Now they, now they got this mop look. You know, this stupid. I mean, it's ridiculous. We saw a kid the other day. You know, walking along the street with his skateboard, and he he looked like a fool. Yeah. I mean, he had his hair like dyed, like blonde or something. You know, and and it was like curly, and I mean, it, it just you could barely even see his face. I mean, it was it was just. Ridiculous. Okay. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. Uh, we're going to see what the Bible says about how women should dress. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay? Um, your clothing should not draw attention to your body, basically is what the Bible's saying there. Uh, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Okay. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, 
whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Let me just stop there very quickly. Who's the hidden man of the heart for a Christian lady? Jesus Christ. Okay, and an unsaved husband can actually see that through the way the woman acts. Okay, that's important. Um, and look at the end of verse 4, which is in the sight of God of great price. We're going to see that in Proverbs chapter 31, which we'll be getting to later. But, you know, if I was a woman, I would want to do things that would please the Lord. I'm a man. I want to go through the Bible and look for what God says a man is supposed to do and do those things. You know, I'm not supposed to go through and look at what women are supposed to do and, and try to do that because it's not written to me. You know, and likewise, a woman shouldn't go through the Bible and look for things that pertain to men and say, well, I'm good enough to do that or, you know, I can do that. You know, and this uh, anything you can do, I can do better kind of philosophy. That shouldn't be. You know, that's not of the Lord. Women are made for different purposes. They have different qualities that men do not have. And it's important to note those distinctions. Okay, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Okay, so feminism, and we're going to see this. I'm going to read some quotes from some uh, of the world's greatest feminists. And it's incredible, but we'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, but feminist feminism, modern feminism, teaches that the man needs to be put down. The man needs to be, you know, you need to be above the man and everything. That's not what the Bible teaches. And they teach that men, you know, women are slaves to their husbands and stuff. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. Men are to honor their wives. It isn't about... The man, you know, like in Islam or something, the woman's forced to wear, be all covered up, and, you know, if she gets out of line, beat her and stuff like that. That isn't it. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that a man should honor his wife. And it's interesting there, it says about that if you don't honor your wife, your prayers will be hindered. It says, you know, that you're to do this, that your prayers be not hindered. Verse 7. So, there is a sense there where God has built in some rules into marriage saying to the man, you're to honor your wife. If you don't, I'm not going to answer your prayer. So that's, you know, it isn't that God puts women down. He just has a different role for them. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to point number two um, about women being submissive to men in the home. Okay, so turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. And, of course, there in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, we did see the thing about uh, the woman being the weaker vessel and submitting to her husband. Uh, but we're going to see a little bit more of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Okay. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay. Turn to Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to see a little bit more of this. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Okay. Uh, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ who also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated, hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it, or nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. It's interesting there. Um, the mystery of the church is spoken there. And the church, the Christian church, is actually symbolized as a bride, as a woman. And she is joined to Jesus Christ. And, of course, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be, you know, right there close to the end of the tribulation before we come back down. So, again, the Bible does not is not a book that puts women down and keeps them oppressed and crushes them into the ground. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is very, you know, God is very, uh, you know, uh, he respects women, basically. Okay, um, and we're not going to read it here, but you can read about the marriage of the uh, lamb and everything in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. And then, of course, as the bride, you can read about the church in Revelation 21, verse 2 and 9. Um, but the women, women are not only supposed to submit to their husband in the home, but they're also s supposed to submit in the church. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Okay. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Okay. Um, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing there. Back in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 34 through 35, that the Bible says that women are to keep silent, and if they want to, if they have any questions, if they want to learn anything, they're to ask their husband at home. Why is that? Well, we're going to see here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now remember the order. I think it was in, there in Ephesians. It's God, Jesus Christ, husband, wife. That's the order. Where does the pastor fit in? He doesn't. The pastor is to be an overseer of the flock. He's the one to teach the people the word of God. But it's the responsibility of the man to know the word of God and so instruct his wife and his children, not the preacher. If the wife has a question, she doesn't say, oh, excuse me, honey, I got, I got to call the pastor. I have a question for him. No, no, no. That doesn't work that way. The wife is to go to her husband because he is in, he's the next step up. And uh, just a point I want to make quickly, um, the fact is, there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says that Jesus Christ is, you know, Christ Jesus is, is the one who's the mediator between God and and men, okay? So, when we pray, we are supposed to pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus and God are one. I understand that. But, there's a difference there. Okay? And, and it says here, I mean, if, if we're just supposed to pray to Jesus, if we're just supposed to go right to Jesus, why would it say that he's the mediator between us and God? God the Father has authority in heaven, okay? And we're to pray to Him in the name of Jesus Christ. And I just want to make that point uh, very quickly. 
Um, anyhow, so again, authority is God, Jesus Christ, man, woman. The preacher doesn't come in there. Okay, and uh, very quickly, I just want to say too, um, what if a woman is unmarried? Well, then she should be under the spiritual headship of her father. Okay, uh, what if she has no father? Well, then she should be under the spiritual headship of her pastor. The point is a woman should have a man above her. It's not that a woman has to pray to the man and then that goes to God or something. No, you can pray right to God through Jesus Christ. You can do that. But the point is in spiritual matters, a woman should have spiritual headship. Uh, now look down at verse 11 there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Um, sorry, no female preachers. And, uh, of course, you know, they don't want to believe in that. But uh, look down at uh, for, or chapter 3 there, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Okay, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Uh, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You can't make it any more clear than that. He, 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 man, you know, his. It's so obvious. But it's interesting, too, if you ever you know, uh, listen to a female preacher, they'll almost act like a man. A good example of that is Joyce Meyer. You look at her, she walks like a man, she has mannerisms of a man. And you know, and and she'll she'll kind of make little jokes about her husband out there, you know, put him down and stuff. You know, and I mean, I'm sorry, but that guy's a sissy. Any man that could sit there in the congregation, you know, sitting there, I was my wife up there preaching, you know, she preach it, honey, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, it's a feminine I mean, that's disgusting. How could you, as a man, have your wife be your pastor? I mean, you know, but see, it messes up the order. God, Christ, man, woman. Oh, no, it's God, Christ, woman, man. See, it, it just it perverts the whole thing. It messes it up. But what is that? It's feminism is what it is. And it goes much, much deeper than that. I just want to say quickly, as I did this study, I kind of thought, well... Is this really a big issue? And we're going to see how deep this thing really goes. Feminism, the satanic philosophy of fem feminism, has gotten into the churches. And they are, I mean, it's crazy what's going on. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but basically there, you know, women are to submit to the, to the, to the men in the home and in the church. Women are not supposed to be the head of the home. They're not supposed to be the head of the church. Period. That's the way it's supposed to be. And number three, uh, women are to be keepers at home. First Timothy chapter 5. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 14. Now this thing goes, This these two verses here go directly against uh, feminist teaching, which we'll see later. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Okay? And if you remember the wolf hunting um, sermon, false prophets go after women in the home. That's their favorite target. Why? Because women are to guide the house. The man is supposed to be out earning a living, the woman is to be at home guiding the house, teaching the children. You know, that's what's 
important for a woman to do. It's not, oh, you have a lesser role, you're a slave to your husband or something like that. No, it's a very important role. And, and of course, women are a lot more sensitive than men are. So they're a lot better at handling little children. Men aren't so good at that. But they come out with all these Hollywood movies, you know, Mr. Mom and all this stuff, where the woman's out, has the career, and the man's at home doing all these effeminate types of things. It's not supposed to be that way. Okay. Uh, turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. It's talking about women here again. God has a lot to say about women, and it's and it's not, you know, bad. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, speaking of women, it says, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. There you see that again. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Okay, women are to be keepers at home. Now turn back to probably the most famous portion in the Bible on, on a good woman. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. Okay, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? That's something to think about there. You know, that God would say that a, a virtuous woman is, her price is far above rubies. Uh, verse 11. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it. Now look at that very quickly. She selleth it. God's not against women having some kind of an income. But it should not come at the price of her not taking care of her home. God is perfectly okay with that. Because you see in all these other pat or all these other verses, she, you know, is not afraid of the winter because she, you know, um, not afraid of the snow of her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet, verse twenty one. So she takes care of her home and then with the extra she sells it. God's not against that. Um, verse 24, And delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now, if you're a woman, occasionally it would be good for you to go down through that list and see how you're doing. Okay? Uh, now we're going to look at some other things here, but if you want to read about two more godly women in the Bible... You can read through the book of Ruth and Esther. And it's interesting, God dedicates two whole books of the Bible to women, to good women, to give an example. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the actual satanic conspiracy. I'll say that. 
of feminism. And I'm going to play a video or a, a clip here that you're going to be able to listen to of Aaron Russo. Aaron Russo uh, is dead now, but he was basically a Hollywood movie producer who had some very rich, um, very rich, powerful friends, one of which was uh, Nicholas Rockefeller. And this is what he's talking about, some of his meetings with Nick Rockefeller. Uh, it's it's very, very interesting to hear this interview. This is an interview with uh, Alex Jones interviewing Aaron Russo shortly before Aaron Russo died. Okay, now, I just want to say this. Aaron Russo was not a saved man. He was a Hollywood man, very, very rich, very wealthy. He managed uh, Bette Midler. He's one, He made her a success. I mean, this guy owned nightclubs. He was, you know... Far from being a Christian, but listen to what he says about feminism here. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he well, we were, he's at the house one night, and uh, we were talking. He would talk, and he started laughing. He said, "Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about?" And uh, I said, I, "I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point." And I said, "I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote." You know, and he started to laugh. He said, "You're an idiot," and I said, "Why am I an idiot?" He said, "You want me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib. You know, and we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television. The Rockefeller Foundation." He says, "And you want to know why?" He said, "There were two primary reasons, and they were one reason was we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib, and the second reason was." Now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. It breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim primary reasons for women's lib, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. Okay. Uh, I think that's very interesting. Um, and, of course, if you don't know about the conspiracy, you really should study it. Uh, a lot of Christians have this faulty notion that the Antichrist kingdom, the one world government, is just going to happen after the rapture. Well, I hate to tell you, but it's being, it's, they've been building this thing, the rich and powerful, the international banksters, which is what the Rockefellers are. They have been building a one world government for centuries now. I mean, you can date this thing back hundreds of years that they have been working and building behind the scenes, and now they're starting to come out in the open. You can get on YouTube, you can get on the internet, and you can look up, just put in New World Order. And you'll find speech after speech after speech where they're just coming out publicly on national television and admitting, you know, we're bringing in a new world order. We're going to bring in a world, war, a one world government. And Satan is the one who's directing this. And a lot of the people, like Alex Jones, they'll present it from somewhat of a secular view where it's the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and, and the Bilderbergers and all, and CFR and all that. But then he'll kind of leave out Satan. Satan is the one that's directing this whole thing. And Satan is the one who came up with this thing of feminism. And if you look back at Babylon, ancient Babylon, you had Semiramis. Um, after Nimrod was killed, his wife, Semiramis, took over. And there you had the beginning, the start of feminism. The thing of empowering women and making men subservient to women. Okay, So it does go back quite a ways. But this thing of, of feminism, it's it's kind of interesting because the devil, you know, he's smart enough to realize that feminism is not going to work, so to speak. But that's the point. It's not designed to succeed. They're never going to get to the point where they've overthrown men and whatever. In the, in the uh, tribulation, you're going to have the Antichrist running things. The Antichrist is a man. So as I read through some of the philosophy here of these feminists, you know, they're they're making it this thing that it's a cause, you know, and they're going to fight for this cause, and eventually women will, will rule over men. Well, no. 
you know, it's not going to happen. But that's not the point. The point is the devil formed this thing to for four reasons. And the four reasons are, number one, to destroy the family. Number two, to destroy Christianity. Number three, to uh, introduce and popularize lesbianism. And the worst one of all, number four, is eugenics. And that's the biggest one. We're going to get into that here in this next section. Okay, turn over to Proverbs 14, verse 1. Point number one about feminism, what modern feminism does, and it, and just very quickly, our modern feminism that we have, uh, there was some in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the suffrage thing, women's suffrage and all that, and, but it really got underway in the 1960s, the whole hippie movement. And of course it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You're having this thing of women coming out and I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Okay? A woman, remember, a false prophet will go after a woman so that she will destroy the house. Okay? It's not that the devil can't get a man and get the man to destroy the house. That can happen too. But a false prophet will go after the woman. And a woman, a wise woman, if you remember the, the woman there in Proverbs chapter 31, she was building her house. She was rising up while it was still night and getting meat, you know, for them. And she was making their clothing and, you know, she was building, trying to make the house better. But a foolish woman will pluck it down. She'll attack her husband. She'll, you know, be on him all the time. That's, you know, what they do. Uh, but let's, uh, I'm going to read some quotes here from some of the leading feminists. And I'm only going to be able to read about a third of these quotes. The other ones I won't even read. They're just that filthy. It's horrible. Uh, Linda Gordon. She says, The nuclear family must be destroyed, whatever its ultimate meeting, the break Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process. She wants to destroy the family. Robin Morgan, we can't destroy the inequities between men and women until we destroy marriage. Okay, now this next woman um, is, well, I guess this is still Robin Morgan. And this is a uh, quote from her book. The Demon Lover. <laughs> I thought that was pretty appropriate. Um, page 316. Did she die of the disease called family? Speaking about a woman. You know, she, does, she died of the disease called family. It's incredible. Okay, turn to the next quote. Um, here another woman writes, uh, Satan-like men possess women. Okay. Um, another one considering the nature and pervasiveness of men's violence I would say that without question children are better off being raised without the presence of men mm -hmm. here's another one uh, Heather Hart I think her name is she says since marriage constitutes slavery for women it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution Freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. Okay, no, I'm sorry, that was Sheila Cronin. Okay, let's see if there's any other quotes. Yeah, here's one. Uh, Kate Millett says, uh, The care of children is infinitely better left to the best trained practitioners of both sexes who have chosen it as a vocation this would further undermine family structure while contributing to the freedom of women. Okay, that's their that's their purpose. You know, the feminist movement wants to destroy the family. That's uh, the thing number one, the number one goal of feminism. And Mark chapter three verse twenty five says, "And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand." And how many homes have been destroyed by this philosophy of feminism? The woman saying, oh, you aren't going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And the house falls apart. You know, happens a lot. Uh, number two, the second uh, goal of feminism 
is rebelling against Christianity and bringing in witchcraft. And if you study witchcraft, and I have studied it a little bit, witchcraft is about women. You don't have Father God, you have Mother Goddess. And you have the Trinity is basically young woman, mature woman, old woman. Okay? And it, it goes into spring, summer, fall, and then old man, winter, and then he has to be destroyed every year and all this. I mean, it's... Witchcraft is about empowering women. And why do you think that there's such a resurgence of witchcraft with the Harry Potter and modern-day Wicca or Witcha, however you want to say it? You know, witchcraft is being brought back. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Samuel, speaking to Saul, he says to him in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, he says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Okay, and there's more to the verse there, but I'm just just wanted to read that point. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, if you're worshiping a mother goddess, who aren't you worshiping? Father God. Okay, it's saying I don't want the masculine trinity of God the Father, God the Son, you know, uh, God the Holy Spirit. You don't want that because that's masculine. So you replace it with a feminine thing. Um, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But let me read some quotes here uh, illustrating what I'm talking about from these feminists. Okay. And this is a good one, too. Uh, Gloria Steinem, editor of Ms. Magazine. She says... Overthrowing capitalism is too small for us. We must overthrow the whole patriarch. Okay? Uh, here's another quote. Marriage has existed for the benefit of men and has been a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not to live individually with men. All of history must be rewritten in terms of oppression of women. We must go back to the ancient female religions like witchcraft. Right there you have it. Declaration of Feminism, November 1971. Um, another quote here uh, by this Gloria Steinem of uh, Ms. Magazine. By the year 2000, we will, I hope, raise our children to believe in human p potential, not God. Again, she says, uh, let's forget about the mythical Jesus and look for encouragement, solace, and inspiration from real women. 2,000 years of patriarchal rule under the shadow of the cross ought to be enough to turn women toward the feminist salvation of this world. Okay. Here's another one. Um... It says, uh, this woman says, the first males were mutants. <laughs> the male sex represents a de degeneration and deformity of the female. That's not what the Bible teaches. Men came first and then the women. Woman was taken out of man. Okay? Uh, man, an obsolete life form, an ordinary creature who needs to be watched. <laughs> nice. And believe me, I'm, I'm reading the, the mild ones. I mean, some of this stuff is just, horrible and filthy. Um, now remember, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now just to show you that in the modern church, it isn't just a movement of women being on an equal plane with men. It's going beyond that. And we're actually seeing the satanic witchcraft philosophy of feminism coming into the church. And three perfect examples. I have here three of these new satanic Bible versions. Um, first, the today's New International Version, which is a openly feminist Bible. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one me mediator between God and human beings, Christ Jesus himself human. See how they do that? 
And remember, uh, chapter 3 of First Timothy there talks about a uh, bishop being a man. Uh, this one says, Here is a trustworthy saying, Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Whoever. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if a man. But see, there's a satanic conspiracy to bring feminism into the church. And of course, here we have a Bible zine, and you got this girl on the front. You know, what's the Bible say about a proud look? You know, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. You know, proud look. And there's a couple of interesting things in here I want to read. There's a, they have these, all these little sections in here. One of the questions that they have, question and answer is, question. God is neither male nor female, so why does everyone refer to God as he? That's witchcraft. That is not Christianity. God is a man. God is masculine. He's a male. Okay? I mean, it's, it's insane. And right there in your little Bible zine. See? Now, now how did that get in there? Okay? Uh, but let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, in this satanic thing. Um, there is one God and one way human beings can reach God. That way is through Christ Jesus, who is himself human. Now, why are they putting human in there? I mean, is there any question that Jesus Christ was not a man? Of course he was a man. But, see, they attack that. They can't stand that. Okay? Um and of course, chapter 3, verse 1, What I say is true. Anyone wanting to become an elder desires a good work. Okay? Anyone. Man or woman. And finally, uh, the Harper Collins, uh, which of course produces the Satanic Bible, New Revised Standard Version. This is another feminist Bible. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God... There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human. Okay, chapter 3, verse 1, this saying is sure. Whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. <laughs> yeah. So you see, it isn't just feminism is out there in the world and you should worry about it and stuff. This satanic movement is moving right in to the apostate churches. And you have... Many of the mainstream churches now in America are adopting these satanic new Bible versions that are openly admitting to being feminist. So it's, it's crazy. An ancient satanic witchcraft belief system is now into the churches. And of course, I don't say into the church because the church in the Bible is the body of Christ. And I think these modern churches are not part of that church. They're not part of the body of Christ. They're being led by false prophets, and the majority of the people are not saved. Um, but just another thing here quickly, my collation that I did. Of course, everybody here is familiar with this thing. Uh, but the TNIV removes the word man 1,713 times. Okay? And by the way, if, if uh, you're listening to this and you think that, well, that's the TNIV, but the NIV is okay. The NIV removes it 1,115 times. So the NIV also, you know, has some feminist philosophy behind it. And by the way, of course, you know, one of the NIV stylists is Virginia Mollencott, who is also into this whole feminist, radical feminist, lesbian goddess worship stuff. So, you know, the NIV is without question a satanic Bible. Um, so first of all, feminism is about destroying the family. Uh, number two, it's about rebelling against Christianity by practicing witchcraft. And number three, it's about lesbianism. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Okay, Romans chapter 1 verse 25. This is very, very interesting. And of course the new versions will pervert this too because it, you know, they need to cover up their sin. Romans chapter 1 verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Hmm. 
NIV, TNIV, uh, Bible zines, and New Revised Standard Version, they change the truth of God into a lie. Now, the new versions, if you use one, it says exchange the truth of God for a lie. That isn't it. It's changed the truth of God into a lie. Anyhow, verse 25, And worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Excuse me. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. No, God is not for sodomy or lesbianism. Okay? It is a sin. And all these gay churches and gay Christians and all this stuff, you know, there was an article a little while ago about Mennonites. There was a gay group of Mennonites. God's not for that. You know, gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgender, you know, they that was their group. You know, that's satanic. And those people aren't saved, by the way. There's no way. Um, let me read a couple quotes here very quickly. Um, Robin Morgan, Ms. Magazine again. I feel that man-hating is an honorable and viable political act. <laughs> Nice. Uh, she says again, Sexism is not the fault of women. Kill your fathers, not your mothers. What a nice woman. Uh, to call a man an animal is to flatter him. I won't read the rest of that quote. Uh, and this, this woman here, you got to love this. Uh, Valerie Solona uh, is her name. She founded a, a group called Scum. <laughs> So, and it's called Society for Cutting Up Men. Gee, isn't that wonderful? Um, the male is a domestic animal which treated, the male is a domestic animal which, if treated with firmness, can be trained to do most things. <laughs> nice. And then here, here you go again. Uh, I want to see a man beaten to a bloody pulp with a high heel shoe shoved in his mouth like an apple in the mouth of a pig. What a wonderful woman, you know. Real feminine there, you know. It's, it's interesting because that was uh, another member of Scum. <laughs> and uh, her name is Andrea Dworkin. And uh, she died April 9th, 2005. So she's in hell right now and uh, knows better. And we're going to, it's, it's going to be so great because we're going to get to see that stupid woman bow down at the feet of God, the man, you know. At the Great White Throne Judgment. So we'll see you then, Andrea Dworkin. Okay. Uh, Ty Grace Atkinson says, Feminism is the theory. Lesbianism is the practice. That's what this thing's about. And that's why it is so wrong and satanic to bring feminism into the churches. Because it's about lesbianism. Another quote. And this is a good one. Uh, the more famous and powerful I get, the more power I have to hurt men. You know who said that? Sharon Stone, the big movie star. See? You know, that's what happens when you become a celebrity. When you get into that whole Hollywood nonsense, you know, and, and there, you know, there's Christians that are for this American idol thing, and, oh, wouldn't it be neat if so-and-so could become famous? No. Because that's the philosophy you eventually get. You know? The more powerful I get, the more I can hurt men. You know, there's your Hollywood actress for you. Okay, uh, Marilyn French. Next quote: All men are rapists, and that's all they are. And uh, this one's kind of an interesting, interesting thing because she was one of Al Gore's presidential advisors. <laughs> so, of course, you don't have anything to worry about being around Al Gore. He ain't much of a man. Um, okay, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, this is one that actually she dates back to the late 1800s. Uh, we are, as a sex, infinitely superior to men. And she died in 1902, so she knows better as well. Okay, and finally, 
uh, point number four, eugenics. And this is something I, that's becoming more and more apparent as time goes by. Um, turn back to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8. There's a lot of things that don't seem to make any sense, um, such as abortion, uh, sodomy, birth control, uh, the vaccination thing, fluoridated water and toothpaste. A lot of that stuff doesn't seem to make any sense until you look at it through eugenics uh, philosophy. So uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35 For whoso findeth me findeth life and, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. You see, those that rebel against God, those that hate God, they all have one thing in common. They love death. And you can see these quotes, Jacques Cousteau, uh, Ted Turner, all these guys, they all talk about killing Huge masses of people. The Georgia Guidestones. You can look this stuff up on the internet. It's not conspiracy theory. It's fact. The Georgia Guidestones say that we need to maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. There's over 7 billion people, I think, right now. Okay? How are you going to get, down, get it down to 500 million? Unless you kill people. And that's what their plans are. And... Sadly, a lot of the feminists don't even realize this, but they're falling right into the eugenicists' hands. Why? A feminist can't have children. If a woman goes out, I'm going to have my career, I'm going to, you know, I won't let a man rule me and all this stuff. Guess what? She just effectively sterilized herself and she isn't ever going to be able to reproduce or anything. Her, when she dies, she's gone. That's it. Okay, and, and and these people are so sick. There was actually a, a a speech that came out where there was a professor that was coming out, and he was saying right up on the stage at this university. This is just a little while ago. This professor was saying we need to reduce human population levels by ninety five percent. He was getting a standing ovation for that. People were getting up and clapping and crying and stuff. People are mentally sick in this country that they would applaud somebody saying, 95% of you have to die. I mean, think about that. That's what they're doing. It's it's absolutely insane. You know, it'd be, I mean, if they actually said to those idiots that were there at that conference, okay, before you leave, um, 1% or 10 will say, no, 5%. 5% of you are going to be allowed to leave. The other ones of you, we're, we're going to kill you. They'd have been screaming. They'd go, oh, what? You know, but see, they think in their warped little brains that they're going to be part of that five percent that gets to live. You know, it's it's insane. Uh, real quick, I'm going to read some quotes here. A couple more feminist quotes. Okay, Sally Miller Gerhardt: The proportion of men must be reduced to and maintained at approximately ten percent of the human race. Yeah. Mary Daly, former professor at Boston College, said this in 2001. If life is to survive on this planet, there must be a decontamination of the earth. I think this will be accompanied by an evolutionary process that will result in a drastic reduction of the population of males. By the way, evolution is about eugenics. And that's it. Okay. Um... Uh, this uh, this is a woman that wrote into a feminist uh, forum. She said, My only comment to men is, if you don't like it, bad luck. And if you get in my way, I'll run you down. <laughs> okay? Catherine A. McKinnon. Feminism, socialism, and communism are one and the same, and socialist communist government is the goal of feminism. Of course, if you study communist Russia, you know that there were mass killings there. Uh, okay. Proverbs chapter 18 to close. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Okay.
Okay? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Okay? That's an important thing there to remember. These people that are writing the new versions and these apostate female preachers and male preachers that are standing up and quote-unquote preaching feminism from the pulpit. And it's all about eugenics. And it's going to come back on them. And all these people, these eugenicists and everything, they're going to get slaughtered in the tribulation. I guarantee you. Yeah, they will be reduced, <laughs> their population. Okay, but now let, let's finish on a, on a spiritual note here. Um, I mean, that's the satanic conspiracy of feminism. It should not be in the church. It has no place in the church. Uh, women and men should be in their proper roles. But again, we'll finish up here with a verse of what God thinks about women. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You can find a good wife and uh, one that wants to know the Bible, one that wants to live by the Bible, then that's a good thing. And you obtain favor of the Lord. God's not against women. You know, I'm not against women. I'm against feminism. And God's against feminism as well. Okay, I'm against feminism because God is. And God speaks against it in His Word. So if you're, again, if you're part of a church or, you know, part of a group of Christians that is promoting feminism, is pr promoting gender-inclusive language, I'd get as far away from them as I could. So, uh, let's close on a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your word. Um, I want to thank you for the fact, Lord, that, that uh, you made me a man and that you gave me certain responsibilities and certain qualities. And uh, I do want to thank you too, Lord, for women and the uh, qualities that you've given them and and uh, just uh, for the separation between us, Lord. I'd, I just pray that this message would be able to go out to um, some women out there and, and even some men that are confused on this issue and that haven't seen the uh, very serious nature, the satanic nature of this modern movement of feminism. And uh, if there is a, a young woman that has listened to this message, if she's made it this far, I pray, Lord, that she would really um, submit herself, uh, not to me, not to um, this teaching or whatever, but that she would submit herself to your word and that she would seek to be a Proverbs 31 woman, that uh, um, she would just seek to, to live by your word, Lord. And uh, I just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.